Hi, I'm Susan Lappin. And I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. And uh, my wife and I do a, uh, a weekly column called Ask the Rabbi on our website at rabbidaniellappin.com. And there we take the, the most interesting questions that have been submitted to us on our website during the course of the week, and we respond to them um, in, a, in a column on the site. And we'd like to give you an example of one of these right here. So Paula wrote us and said, I've been listening to your podcast and YouTube teachings for the past three to four weeks. I think I was searching for biblical teachings on finance, and a YouTube search led me to you. I gained more than I was expecting teachings not only on finance, but life. And most importantly, life's teachings from the Bible with a Jewish perspective. I ha do have a nagging issue that has haunted me for most of my life. And because of your teachings about family, it has highlighted the need for me to resolve it once and for all. I am 39 years old now. I am an illegitimate child born from an affair. My biological parents tried to hide the affair in pregnancy by having my mother date and marry my biological father's brother. He raised me, loved me as any father would, but tragically died when I was only three. The truth was revealed to me when I was a teenager, 13 years of age. Up until then, I had spent all my childhood and early adolescent years grieving and longing for a father who died and left me as a child. I was heartbroken. We grew up in a religious home, and in my teenage years, I found solace in religion, believing God would take my pain away. Forgive my biological parents and me for being their child. At 19, I turned to drugs and alcohol to relieve the pain. The addiction to drugs I have only managed to overcome in this past year. My question is, when it comes to family and my situation, who is my father? Because I still feel this immense connection to the father who died. To me, he's my identity. As a child, my world was built with him at the center. The pain I felt when I knew the truth had more to do with losing him as my father, even though I was only three years old when he died. My family and extended family have all tried to make me forget the past and embrace my biological father. But I don't feel at peace with that. Is it okay that I don't? Is it normal to feel this way? Or is it a lack of forgiveness on my part? I feel I have forgiven both biological parents. I believe I've dealt with the shame I felt as a result of their actions. But I can't shake the connection I feel towards my uncle. I call him my dad as the father of my life. And that is how I want to be remembered. Warm regards, Paula. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think we should clarify that uh, we answer these every week and we do not answer them because we are so brilliant or we're uh, psychologists with a lifetime of experience. No, uh, we answer them because we have access to not 30 years of experience, not even 300 years of experience, but we have access to 3,000 years of experience of human interactions. And this is known as ancient Jewish wisdom. And you will see uh, some of it perhaps in some of the books behind us over here and uh, elsewhere in our office as well. So um, we, we, we have much uh, foundation on which to answer this. For instance, one of the questions that is dealt with um, quite regularly in ancient Jewish wisdom is um, the whole question of, uh, firstly, an adopted parent, and secondly, uh, somebody who plays the role of raising a child. And, and this has cropped up in our work as uh, leaders of the synagogue that we planted in Southern California uh, a number of years ago, uh, the way it cropped up there was, and I, I remember the, the people involved several times. Um, for instance, one of them was a, a woman, let's call her Jillian, and uh, she, um, her, her mother divorced and then remarried while she was a very little girl, and she was uh, largely raised by her mother's second husband, her stepfather. And um, there is no classification of stepfather in ancient Jewish wisdom. So we have to understand uh, exactly what it, it really is. And her question was, who would work, walk her down the aisle at her wedding? 
and she very she had nothing to do with uh, uh, the the her real father who's divorced biological, from her, her, her biological, biological father. father divorced uh, but she she knew and she had taken the name of her stepfather and we went into it together with her and were able to show that the 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 question is discussed in terms of if your father your biological father and your the father who raised you uh, are competing for your attention uh, they're both uh, in a in a lake and they need to be rescued or they both ask you to get them uh, a drink of water who do you deal with first who do you respond to first and the answer is the one who gave you uh, spiritual life not the one who gave you biological life and so it's very easy for us, it was easy for us to answer Jillian and say, your stepfather, your adopted father, is the one who walks you down the aisle. He takes precedence. And, and to Paula, there was something similar. The idea being, first of all, I just want to point out that shame is something we should, it's, it's a good emotion when we feel mm. about something we did. Shame about something somebody else did isn't a good emotion necessarily. So you're saying that she her talks, family she is probably, shame. they are probably pressuring her from what I understand in her, in her letter, they would like her to start thinking of her biological, biological father, father as her real father, whom she's never had anything to do with. Well, because I don't know if she's never had anything to do with because it would have been her uncle. She would have thought he was her uncle growing up. Yes. But it's almost like they're saying, look, you know, let's put, let's put the past behind us. And even though she was only three when this, man who she thought was her father died we know that that children who are orphaned very often the image of the father who's held up to them really does influence their growing up terribly strongly and so this is the man whom she pictured as it was terribly sad that he wasn't there to guide her in in a physical as a physical being mm. but his thoughts and his memory are what guided her as she was growing up and so um, what I just want to add about spiritual fathers, very often this might even be a teacher. If a teacher has such a strong influence on you that they actually can become parent-like, not in a Rasputin-like way, but in a good way, where someone really is your spiritual mentor and guide guidepost, that's another example of that. In that way, that person is your spiritual father. And so our answer was that, first of all, kudos to Paula for getting herself off the drugs. You know, in today's day and age, so many people are finding out because of biological testing and gene genealogical testing and not necessarily instigated at their own desire. Sometimes, sometimes they're a byproduct. They, they just find out, are finding out that they were the, that the person who raised them, the man who raised them, and they assumed is their father, biologically isn't. And it does throw people's lives completely. People have a real, Where many people have a, a really hard time. On this? Was it the Wall Street Journal? Uh, there are books written about it. There have been yes. articles about it. And so the idea that it would throw a 13-year-old girl for a loop and set her off on, on years of really having trouble establishing who she is and, and that she got into drugs, I, I would say the most important thing is that she stays stable now. Kudos to her for getting off drugs and getting our life in order. Yes. And the family pressuring her, if that is going to upend her life and, and set her back, she then that's by that definition safely. she can ignore that. On the other hand, if it's possible that maybe maybe they're saying we want you to call this man daddy, your biological father daddy, and in your in her head, daddy is the the spiritual father, the uncle, that maybe if she is okay with this. Maybe she calls him Papa John or Papa Tom. That's a pizza store, so maybe not a good idea there. But let's put <laughs> I don't, we don't know what his name is. <laughs> but Papa Tom. You know, maybe she can come up with a name that kind of acknowledges the family. Mm. If she can do that without an emotional and co psychological cost for herself. Right. But that she is absolutely entitled to say, this is the man who I think of as my father. And while she owes for honor your father and mother she does owe the person who gave her physical life she owes him certain respect and if she's fulfilling certain of his physical needs if he's not able to do that but what she does not have to do is displace the man she thinks of as father and the man she always thought of as her spirit right. is who is her spiritual father in order to make other people happy um, neither Susan nor I ever answer these uh, individually and alone. We collaborate on them as we collaborate on so much else in our married life. And um, 
the, the, the answers we give are the result of prayer and analysis and study and, uh, and exploration. And only when we're both satisfied with the answer do we publish it as, as we have with so this one today. If you would like to read some Ask the Rabbi questions, again, go to our website at rabbidaniellappin.com. Thanks for listening.